<clears throat> Hello and welcome. Uh, today, I am going to be shredding uh, Robert Spencer's new book. He has written a book called The Church and the Pope. Um, however, if you this is just a cover. If you open it up and actually go inside, it gives the full title, The Church and the Pope, The Case for Orthodoxy. So, Spencer uh, has um, known for his books against Islam. He critiques Islam from kind of like a, a Western secular humanist perspective, but kind of throws some Christian fairy dust on it. So, like, it tries to make it look Christian, but it's actually a secular humanist critique of Islam. Like, oh, Islam's against democracy. Who cares? <laughs> I'm against democracy. Anyway, um... Keep in mind, democracy was invented by a bunch of pagan Greek homosexuals. So, I mean, it, it, it's not... Anyway, uh, I'm getting off topic. So, he... Uh, and if you think about it, this is the second... Um, Catholicism is the second r religion he's attacked. In print, anyway. I mean... Um, like uh, he may have had blog articles against this, but um, he uh, he goes after the Catholic Church in here. He's charitable for the most part, and uh, he is um, th this book. There's one book. There's one word I will use to describe this book. Can anyone guess the word? It starts with a P. Anyone in the chat? The word starts with a P. The word Protestant. He basically takes Protestant arguments, uh, and they're not even the good Protestant arguments. You know, you go to people like Father James, the Anglican priest, the, the other Paul, they will give much more solid arguments than this. But um, no, he just takes the worst, like this is a notch above Jack Chick, you know. Um, but, uh, and we're going to, like, this whole book, I could refute this whole book. It's that bad. With ease. But we're just going to go through the scriptural portion where he touches on the three traditional proof texts for the for papal authority um, found in uh, the, the Gospels. Um, and, yes, this is the worst book on the papacy I've ever read. It's even worse than this one. I thought nothing would get worse than this one, than Michael Welton. But we have a new winner. You've been eclipsed, Michael, by Mr. Robert Spencer. All right, let's uh, not waste any more time. Let's, uh, I got to share the, uh, uh, let's share the stuff. The Church and the Pope, the Case for Orthodoxy. Okay. All right, can everyone see this? Okay. Okay. Um, All right, the role of Peter. The role of Peter. The primary New Testament passages that Roman Catholics use to support the claim that Peter had a unique role among the apostles are Matthew 16, 18 through 20, Luke 22, 32, and John 21, 15 through 17. In the passage from Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ says to Peter, quote, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, Greek Petros, a masculine form of blah, 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 and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, close quote. Later in the same gospel, the Lord says much the same thing to the apostles. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So the controversy centers on the significance um, of Jesus giving Peter the name Rock and likewise having the uh, uh, giving him the keys. Was the Lord conferring a particular authority on Peter that was to be passed on to his successors and form the foundation for the papal monarchy? Or were there singular honors conferred upon Peter alone? Or is some other uh, 
there's some other explanation all together. The Roman Catholic interpretation of the passage is that Jesus meant to give Peter particular authority among the apostles and a primacy over the whole church, which special authority and primacy he passed on um, through apostolic succession to the Bishop of Rome. The primacy is confirmed after the resurrection when Jesus tells Peter solemnly three times to, quote, feed my sheep. This special authority included infallibility as Jesus prayed in particular for Peter that his faith fail not Luke twenty two thirty two. I think he's using the King James. Uh, all right. Now we're, it, it's going to get interesting here. Um, all right. Now he says here, Orthodox theologians tend to see the rock not as the person of Peter, but his confession of faith or Christ himself. This is not an innovation. The idea of the rock being Christ is taught by St. Peter himself, who is clearly speaking of the Lord when he writes, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Okay, just because he uses the word rock in more than one way, it does not mean it's the same thing. Rock of offense, rock on which the church is built. Anyway. He says, Orthodox theologians tend to see the rock not as a person of Peter, but his confession of faith or Christ himself. That's incorrect. That is incorrect. That's a, a Protestant interpretation. And people, people will say, oh, Alan, well, can you back that up, Alan? Yeah, I'm going to be quoting. In fact, let me just... Um, oh, whoops. This is the book I'm going to be quoting from. Byzantine Theology by John Meyendorf, a very prominent Orthodox scholar in the um, uh, uh, 20th century. All right, on page... Okay, page 97 of this book, B Byzantine Theology. The personal role of Peter as the rock upon which the church was built was readily recognized by Byzantine ecclesiastical writers. Only late polemicists, systematically anti-Latin, tended to diminish it, but this was not the case among the most enlightened of the Byzantine theologians. Thus, according to Photius, Peter is, quote, the chief of the apostolic choir and has been established as a rock of the church and is proclaimed by the truth to be key bearer of the kingdom of heaven, close quote. Numerous passages similar to that of Photius can be found in Byzantine ecclesiastical literature and hymnography. They're true. Okay, you, you get the idea. So, I mean, John Meindorf is saying all the most sophisticated Byzantine theologians agree that... Uh, that uh, that Peter's the rock, you know, but that's not what Spencer says. Um, all right, uh, let's put Spencer back on the screen. Now, take what I just said. Orthodox theologians tend to see the rock not as the person of Peter, but his confession of faith or Christ himself. This is not an, an you know, okay. <laughs> Clearly, again, that's why I said this book is a um, a Protestant book, because he's taken a Protestant objection. I've just showed you what the Orthodox believe on this. Okay? Um, uh, do, 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 do. Um, all right. Where were we? Um so he has the quote from St. Peter's epistle. St. Jerome also teaches this. Blessed Augustine, meanwhile, teaches that the rock is the church and Peter is the prototype for the episcopate. He doesn't produce a quote. Keep in mind, Augustine has a long corpus and it's interesting how he interprets this passage. Um, these interpretations are not contradictory, but mutually complementary. It is noteworthy, however, that while there are many statements of the Holy Fathers about the preeminence of Peter, nowhere to be found is that Peter is the rock in his very flesh and bones such that it is his presence in Rome and martyrdom that, that elevates 
the see of Rome above all others. Well, I don't think you need to prove m m martyrdom, but the idea that Matthew 16 amongst the church fathers is not applied to Peter and the papacy is insane. It's insane. Like, <laughs> uh, let me, uh, let me add another screen here. Uh, Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to add a new screen here. I just had to set it up. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Okay, I can only share a single screen at a time. This will make things interesting. Share screen. Um, all right. We are quoting the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus here. Wait, can we? Oh. Uh, whoops. I got so many tabs here with sources I need. Um, okay. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, Philip the Presbyter and Legate of the Apostolic See says, there is no doubt, and in fact it has been known in all ages, that the most holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of the apostles, pillar of the faith, foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to him was given the power of binding and loosing sins, who down even to today and forever both lives and judges in his successors. The holy and most blessed Pope Celestine, according to due order, is his successor, singular, and holds his place, and us he sent to supply his place to this holy synod, which the most humane and, uh, and Christian emperors have commanded to assemble, bearing in mind and continually watching over the Catholic faith. For they both have kept and are now keeping intact apostolic doctrine handed down to them by their most pious and humane grandfathers and fathers of holy memory down to the present time. Okay, this is an ecumenical council. And it's contradict, contradicting what Robert Spencer says in his book. Spencer says, no, 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 it's only, uh, th there's no fathers that think this. But we just quote, and this is an ecumenical council accepted by hundreds of bishops. Why is Spencer saying this? So uh, we're going to put Spencer's book back up. Uh, present stop screen okay uh present share screen uh church and the pope case for orthodoxy okay R remember it is noteworthy however that while there are many statements of the holy fathers about the preeminence of peter nowhere to be found is that peter is the rock in his very flesh and bones such that is the presence in Rome and martyrdom that elevates the sea ab above all others. So this is an ecumenical council, uh, hundreds of bishops, no one said a word. And um, I, I, I don't see anything like the, the, this goes exactly against Spencer said. And keep in mind, I also quoted the modern Orthodox theologian, John Meindorf, who knows this perfectly well. All right, so that's shredded. Let's continue. All right. Likewise, Orthodox theologians understand the Feed My Sheep passage as being a threefold reversal of Peter's threefold denial of his Lord on the night of the crucifixion. It was a manifestation of the Lord's mercy, not 
a conferral of authority. This is confirmed by the fact that Peter was grieved by the Lord's thrice repeated question, do you love me? He was not, in other words, honored or overawed at being given such a great responsibility. Clearly, Peter himself did not think at the moment that this happened, that he was being made the Pope. Likewise, the Lord's prayer that Peter's faith may not fail was in anticipation of his denial that he knew Jesus when the Roman guards came to arrest him. It was not a conferral of authority, but an acknowledgement that Peter would be the only apostle besides Judas to deny his master. What's more, the most famous commentary on the meaning of John 21 is in St. John Chrysostom's On the Priesthood, in which, which St. John states that by asking Peter, do you love me? And then saying, feed my sheep, the Lord Jesus is establishing the paradigm for priests, that he will m measure their love for him by how they love his flock. Let me quote uh, from the great Orthodox YouTuber, Jay Dyer. You don't understand paradigms. <laughs> Sorry, had to do that. Um, or at least this paradigm, paradigm for priests. That's really not what he does. I have John Chrysostom's On the Priesthood there. Like, I won't bother reading this. It's just kind of a vague uh, statement there. But again, both Luke 22, 32 and John 21 are applied to the papacy in an ecumenical council that Robert Spencer accepts. Um, he's saying that Luke 22 and John 21 don't believe this. Well, we're going to quote an ecumenical council that he accepts. Uh, oh. Uh, just give me a moment here. Find the quote. All right. Uh, I'm just trying to find out where should I start because I'd like to give the whole context. Uh, okay. I know where I'm going to start. Okay. Um, we're going to take Spencer down. I think we're done with Spencer. This is the only part I wanted to go over, the three proof texts. Um, present, uh, stop screen, present, share screen. It's a shame you can't have multiple on the go at once. Okay. All right. Is it on the screen? Yep, it is. Okay, perfect. Um, okay. For this is the rule of the true faith, which the spiritual mother of your most tranquil empire, the apostolic church of Christ, has both in prosperity and in adversary always held and defended with energy, which it will be proved by the grace of Almighty God, has never erred from the path of apostolic tradition, nor has she been um, depraved by yielding to heretical innovations. But from the beginning, she has received the Christian faith from her founders, the princes of the apostles, and remains undefiled unto the end. According to the divine promise of the Lord and Savior himself, which he uttered in the Holy Gospels, the prince of his disciples saying, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. That's Luke 22. Let your tranquil clemency therefore consider, since it is the Lord and Savior of all whose faith it is that promised that Peter's faith should not fail and exhorted him to strengthen his believers. How it is known to all that the apostolic pontiffs, the predecessors of my littleness, have always confidently done this very thing. How come it's applying it to the papacy? What? of whom also are littleness, since I have received this ministry by divine designation, wishes to be... Okay, you, you get the idea, right? Um, 
he clearly applies it. This is Pope Agatho's l letter in the Sixth Council. Uh, okay, and now we're going to get um, uh, quote John 21. And this is what the blessed Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, teaches. Quote, Feed the flock of Christ, which is among you, not by constraint, but willingly, but exhorting it to God. Therefore, encouraged by these imperial decrees, O most meek Lord of Lords, and relieved from the depth of affliction, I have begun uh, re refreshed somewhat by a better confidence. And it says here, uh, the blessed apostle Peter has delivered that it be not hidden under a bushel, that it is preached um, in the whole earth more shrilly than a bugle, because the true confession thereof, which Peter was pronounced blessed by the Lord of all things, was revealed from the Father in heaven. For That's a reference to Matthew. For he received from the Redeemer of himself all three commendations, the duty of feeding the spiritual sheep of the church under whose protecting shield... The apostolic church has never turned away from the path of truth in any direction of error, whose authority as a prince of the apostles, the whole church, and ecumenical synods have faithfully embraced. Exactly. The ecumenical councils apply these three verses to uh, the church. And, um, and I got one more special treat for you. Um, we are going to put this down. Okay, that's an ecumenical council, Pope Agatho's l letter. Like, you have to accept what an ecumenical council says, right? I mean, like, if you find a single church father saying something, and then an ecumenical council saying something, you have to go with what the ecumenical council says. One, because it's approved by hundreds of bishops. Um... And and two, um, it's ecumenical council. They're fully authority. Now, the Orthodox only accepts seven or eight, but these seven or eight include six and three, which um, have, uh, and by the way, uh, Ma Ma Matthew 16 is pretty much in every ecumenical council. Where it's interpreted, it gives the papal interpretation, which um, Spencer denies erroneously. And Luke twenty two thirty two and John twenty one are in Agatho's letter to uh, the Sixth Council, which was accepted. It's part of the council. It's part of the um, ecumenical council. So we are going to. Uh, one more final treat here for Robert Spencer. Um, in 649, there was a, a Lateran Synod um, presided over by the Pope. It's not ecumenical, but it's pretty much as close to ecumenical as you can get. One notch below. It's not a local synod. And it condemned the monothelite heresy. Um, both Elijah, Yossi, and I have done a response to the the article by um, Mr. Ubi Petrus um, on his site. And we do a, like two two-hour sessions going through his article using the primary source to re rebut what Petrus says on this council, he tries to say. But um, r regardless, um, in this, you have a Greek arch archbishop. This is in the 7th century. A, a, a Greek archbishop from Palestine named uh, Archbishop Stephen of Dor, or Dora, as it's sometimes said. Um, he um, wrote a, l a letter to the Pope, and this was accepted at the council. And he applies Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21 all to the Pope in opposition to what Robert Spencer says in his book, which I showed you on the screen. I'm going to pull this up. Uh, uh, share screen. This is kind of like my final... Um, 
Okay, can you guys see this? Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, oh, whoops, wrong tab. Uh, all right. Okay, we are going to read Stephen of Dore's letter to Pope Martin. Keep in mind, this is 30 years before Constantinople III, the ecumenical council that I wrote. Um. Uh, the, the the ecumenical council, sorry. This is 30 years before Constantinople III, the ecumenical council where that applies to Luke 22 and John 21 uh, to the papacy. I'm just going to show that that was not an outlier. You had the hundreds of bishops, mostly Greek, Constantinople III, who accepted. You have a Greek archbishop writing a letter, which about 100 Latin bishops um, accept. And we are going to go with what he says right here. Uh, and taking it, Anastasius, a regional notary of the Apostolic See, read out, translated from Greek into Latin, the heading, to the most holy. Okay, it says Pope Martin, the holy and most blessed Pope, of God's Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of Rome said, according to the request of Stephen, the most uh, God-beloved Bishop of Dora, let his uh, plaint be received from him and read. And taking it, Anastasius, regional notary of the Apostolic See, read out, translated from Greek into Latin. The, the, the heading... And he says, uh, the, uh, Price, the guy who edited this book, says, I translated the Greek text. Um, it says, the heading to the Holy and Apostolic Synod convened in this renowned and elder Rome according to the grace of God and the authoritative bidding of Martin, the thrice-blessed Pope, who is religiously presiding over it for the sacred confirmation and vindication of the definitions and decrees of the fathers and the council of the Catholic Church. I, Stephen, by the mercy of God, bishop and first man in the jurisdiction subject to the Archiepiscopal See of Jerusalem, present what follows. So he's um, a, a, a bishop from the Holy Land. The text, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who by the blessed and Episcopal convening of your most holy selves has consoled us in all our affliction, and namely that which we feel for his holy Catholic Church because of those who oppose the word of faith. For like wild waves, they assailed and troubled her with their heresy when honored by God. She was enjoying peace and calm. First of all, uh, Theodore, Bishop of Ferran, then uh, Cyrus of Alexandria, and subsequently Sergius of Constantinople and his successors, Pius and Paul. For these men revived the doctrines of heretics, Apollinarius and Severus, by which they held and defined one will and one operation of the Godhead and manhood of Christ. There is testimony to this in their writings, which they disseminated throughout the world for the deception and the more simple-minded, for they contrived not only to expound and record these doctrines, but also to publish them openly in opposition to all the doctrines of the fathers and councils of the church, by means both of chapters read out from the pulpit and written anathemas against those whose beliefs from theirs and decrees, subscriptions, and recordings of proceedings. I'm, I'm sorry, I have to read this all. I don't want to be accused of quote mining, but it's not that much further. And he says, as a result of their troubling the whole Catholic Church in this way, in the words of the Blessed Jeremiah, quote, we have been put to shame because we heard reproach against us it has covered our face with reversal because aliens have entered our sanctuary for this reason we the pious all of us have been looking everywhere sometimes for quote water for the head and foundations of tears for the eyes close quote for lamenting the pitiable catastrophe and sometimes for the wings of the dove in the words of the divine david so that we might fly away and announce these things to see that rules and presides over all others. I mean, your sovereign and supreme see 
in quest of healing. So he's talking about the, the, the papal see quest of healing for the wounded afflicted. It has, it has been accustomed to perform this authoritatively from the first and from old uh, here, just to let you see it. I will, um, I will put it up and let me try to zoom in here. Okay. On the basis of its apostolic and canonical authority, for the reason, evidently, that the truly great Peter, head of the apostles, was deemed worthy not only to be entrusted alone out of all with the keys of the kingdom of heaven for both opening them deservedly to those who believe and shutting them justly to those who do not believe in the gospel of grace. So that's Matthew 16. But also because he was the first to be entrusted with shepherding the sheep of the whole church. As the text runs, Peter, do you love me? Shepherd my sheep. And again, because he possessed more than all others in an exceptional and unique way, firm and unshakable faith in our Lord, he was deemed worthy to turn and strengthen, strengthen his comrades uh, and spiritual brethren. Does it, does this sound familiar? When they were wavering since providentially, he had been adorned by God who became incarnate for the sake of power and priestly authority over them all. Oh, uh, let me just see. Yeah, so strengthen the brethren. That's Luke 22. So you see this Greek bishop of the early church, Stephen of Dor, applying Matthew 16, Luke 22, John 21, all to the Pope. But wait, that's not what um, Mr. Robert Spencer says in his book. Uh, let me just... That's not what Spencer says in his book. Well, Spencer is incorrect. Um, hey, how are you, brother? What's it going? God bless. Hi, Eric. Hallie, Settlers, Miles, Natalie, McV uh, McVine. A lot of good people here. God bless all of you. Thanks for watching this. Uh, remember to like this video. And I assume all of you guys have subscribed. But just like the video and share it if you can. So that is how he treats the scriptural text of the church and the Pope. That's only two pages of this entire book. But the whole church is the same kind of caliber. Um, I, I mentioned that it's essentially Protestant arguments, and, and, the, and that's true. Um, he uh, spends a good chunk of time on Pope Honorius, and Pope Honorius actually proves the papacy, the whole s situation. He spends less than a page on Pope Vigilius, which I think is a much better argument than Pope Honorius. But, but keep in mind, he's using Protestant arguments, so he doesn't know this. So, Robert, um, I, oh, hey, brother, how are you doing? Um, so I think what we need here is to, um, w what m m Mr. Spencer needs is to re-examine re all that he's wrote. I don't think he's looked at the best r responses to these arguments. So I think he'll need to do that and and pray for the man. Let's hope he he comes back. All right, I got a few minutes for questions. Are there any questions for anyone? But but overall, it, it's very weak arguments. Like I said, it surpassed two paths for the worst book on the papacy. The best book on the papacy, written by a non-Catholic, is Trevor Jelland. Uh, he's an Anglican uh, scholar from uh, the the mid uh, the mid twentieth century. He wrote in the nineteen forties. Eric told me about the book. It's it's great. It's called um, I can't remember the the title of it. It's over there. I don't want to go get it, but uh, it's it's an Anglican book. Uh, it's called Church and Papacy or something. It's a thick book. It's five six hundred pages. It's good. It's good. It's a very objective study. He does not believe in the papacy, um, but he does not make arguments like you see coming from uh, our good friend, Mr. Spencer. 
So if there's no questions, I'll just kill the stream. I, I wanted to get through this quickly. Um, yeah, so that's what uh, I just wanted to share that. The, the whole he, he goes over the same cliche arguments, Victor, Cyprian. Of course, he doesn't uh, talk about how the later theologians looked like like i'm not talking like the medieval church i'm talking about uh, um, uh, people like saint vincent of laren saint jerome uh how they view the uh the the episode with saint cyprian after the fact so i think whoa what is up sam how are you all right um so yeah, so I just think um, Spencer needs to reevaluate re some of his arguments. Um, take a look at the best that Catholic Paul just has to offer on this. Uh, I, I don't, I don't believe he's done that. He's only been an Orthodox Christian for a few years, uh, so that's why he probably didn't know what John Meindorf had said about that stuff. Keep in mind, I'd read. Uh, if you go to this book, read page ninety-seven and. Um, 98 and 99 and and it'll go through all of um the, the analysis of the paywall from a but he he he's fairly well known and i know that uh jay dyer is a huge fan of this book he promotes this book so i'm not promoting something that's uh not l liked by the, the orthodox community on y youtube anyway and i think mr spencer should uh take a look at this and the Catholic r responses and um, yeah, and reevaluate some things. All right. So that's all. Thanks for tuning in guys. Um, pray for me and, um, and go and, uh, and uh, to all my Canadian viewers out there happy thanksgiving it's thanksgiving this weekend we have it about a month before the states and it's celebrated the exact same way as the states a lot of harvest foods like turkey ham potatoes corn stuffing uh, uh cranberry sauce so we get that this weekend and i was actually invited because of course of the last two years i've been not uh invited to family thanksgiving because i haven't taken a certain controversial drug which i'm not going to say online um so i posed a danger so i was not invited but then another family member who's hosting thanksgiving both he and his wife um who also haven't taken this controversial m medication uh invited me so I, I'm eternally grateful for them. Shout out to you guys if you're watching. And God bless you. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And um, and if you're outside of Canada, I wish you a blessed weekend all the same. Um, and I will sign off now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and watching. I hope you found this useful. And God bless all of you. Bye.